Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you for being here today. I'm Kate. I work here at the Schomburg Township District Library. Um, if you have not already, please silence your cell phones. And if you need the restroom, it's out any of these doors to your left along the back wall of the library. Um, today, we are hosting the Hoffman Estates Village Board of Trustees Candidate Forum. Um, and we're very proud to be hosting that here at the library. It is our goal to give you information all the time um, so that you can participate in civic life. And uh, we are very thankful for our partners, the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area, who always run a really great, fair, nonpartisan candidate forum. Um, so with that, I will introduce uh, Vicki Martin with the League. Thank you all for coming. Uh, like Kate said, my name is Vicki Martin, and I am uh, one of the forum chairmen for the League of Women Voters. Um, the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area uh, includes Schaumburg and Palatine and several of the other communities which share contiguous borders and legislative districts. And before we begin our forum today, I'd like for all of us to take a moment and reflect on why we're actually here. <laughs> our elections are a key part of our democracy. It's what makes our country strong. And with that in mind, we would like those of you who are comfortable doing so to rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. during the forums. And we ask that the candidates refrain from attributing any position to opposing candidates. To ensure that today's questions, uh, that the questions for today's forums represent a balance of issues, we solicited topics from the candidates and the community at large. Questions for today's forum were prepared in advance and prioritized using feedback we received. They were vetted by a bipartisan team of League members. Questions deemed to be negative or directed to any specific candidate were eliminated. Because questions were prepared in advance, we will not, we will not be accepting questions from the audience today. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's forum, Kim Inman. Kim is a co-president of the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area and has been trained by the League and has moderated many forums, so we're very fortunate to have her with us here today. Kim. Thanks, Vicki, and thanks to the Schomburg Library for having us here today. I'm happy to be here on this sunny, cold, almost <laughs> snowy day. I saw snowflakes a minute ago um, to moderate this forum. I am a resident of Palatine, and I'm not eligible to vote in this particular election, so I have been asked to serve as your impartial facilitator for this discussion. All right, let me take a couple minutes to explain the rules for the forum. Um, some of the questions, as Vicki said, were submitted by the audience in advance. Others came from the candidates or other interested groups in the community. They, the questions have all been vetted and um, made to word in a way that is neutral, nonpartisan, and it will allow every candidate to um, present themselves in the best possible light. All of the candidates have agreed to abide by the following ground rules. Um, first, we have drawn numbers to determine speaking order, and the speaking order you'll see is here, is how our candidates are seated. We will be alternating who goes first on each question. Um, each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. Each candidate will have one minute to answer each question. I'll repeat the questions if necessary, um, and if needed, a rebuttal can be requested. So candidates, if you have a rebuttal, just raise your hand and say, I'd like a rebuttal. And each of you will have uh, two rebuttals for the forum, and the rebuttals are limited to 30 seconds each. They'll be timed. Um, at the end, each candidate will have a one-minute closing statement. Okay, 
And we have a ta our timers here in the front row from the League of Women Voters raising their hands. All right, and the candidates, you'll be giving, uh, you'll be given a 30 second warning, a 15 second warning, and then the dreaded stop sign <laughs> when your time is up. Um, please complete your thoughts quickly, but or before you before you see the stop cards, we 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 will be re, we will be holding you at account for the time limits, so all candidates have you know the equal amount of time to answer. Um, we're also asking that you not interrupt one another. We also ask you, the audience, to re, uh, to behave in a courteous and respectful manner. Please hold your applause until the very end of the forum. Anyone booing or heckling will be asked to leave. Please remember that each of these candidates are your neighbors. They have devoted enormous amounts of time, energy, and sometimes money um, in their effort to represent uh, the community. They deserve your, our, all of our gratitude and respect, regardless of their viewpoints on the issues. All right, today's forum is being recorded for the League of Women Voters to use in educating the public. A video of this forum will be available next week on the League of Women Voters of the Palatine Area website. It will also be available on the Schomburg Library website. No voice, image, or other duplication of the forum may be used for the candidate's um, campaign or during campaign advertising. The League of Women Voters claims copyright ownership of all recordings or transcripts produced from this event and reserves the right to publicize this forum. So again, to view the forum next week, look at the Palatine, uh, League, League of Women Voters Palatine Area website or the library's website. All right, today we have four candidates vying for three seats on the Hoffman Estates Board of Trustees. Each seat is for a four-year term, and with us today and on the ballot, are, and I'm going in on seating order here, are Gary Stanton and Anna Newell, Gary Palapas, and Mark Mueller. And we'll begin with your one minute opening statements. And uh, as Gary drew number one, he'll be going first on this. Aren't I lucky? Yes, you are. <laughs> I'll just stand up quickly. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Gary Stanton, and I am on the current board of uh, Hoffman Estates as a trustee. I have been for the last 12 years. I'm seeking a, another term, which would put me in a fourth term. And I'm doing that because I've enjoyed working uh, in Hoffman Estates as a trustee uh, for those last 12 years. And before that, I was uh, on the planning commission of Hoffman Estates and I was uh, appointed to that position in 1988 and served on that until like 2010. Uh, when I was appointed as a trustee and then was elected later in 2011. Uh, so that is why I'm running. I have been an attorney. I still am an attorney. I practiced uh, law and uh, as a public defender. And uh, but that was for 33 years. I guess that's a short background of who I am. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, next, uh, Anna will have our opening statement. Good morning. It still is. And yes, she's right. Was snowing. Um, I'm Anna Newell. I've lived in Hoffman Estates for almost 30 years. Um, some on the south end, and now I'm out on the west end of where all the corn and all the good stuff is out west. Um, nice place to live in Hoffman. I love the people. There's my answer. Why do I want to do this? Because I've done this before. I've done this for four terms, which is really technically 16 years. Oh, she's giving me the yellow already. Oh my gosh, I can't even blow it like a stop sign. But anyway, I love doing this. I want to continue doing this, and I hope I continue to serve the people the way I have for the last four terms. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and we have two Gary's on the, on the panel today, so now we're moving on to Gary P. for an opening statement. Thank you, Kim. Um, my name is Gary Palapas. I'm one of the candidates for trustees. Uh, I started my journey in government in the uh, United States Marine Corps when I joined when I was 17 years old. Um, it was active duty for about a year and a half and got shipped to Desert Storm where I became a Marine combat veteran. So uh, much like elected office, it's been in the vicinity of bullets before. So with that, uh, I got out. I moved back to the Palatine North Hoffman area where my wife and I, Michelle, um, you know, started our family, and I uh, was appointed to the Palatine Township Zoning Board. 
And then uh, got a call one day to run for trustee, and I've been doing that for the last 16 years. I love it, I love our community, the people that uh, make that community, and uh, I just love you know, uh, the, the liberation side of you know, what I do, and uh, would like to continue. Thank you. All right, and um, Mark. Thank you, and thank the league for hosting this great event. Um, so I grew up in Hoffman Estates. I uh, went to St. Hubert's, grew up in Parcel C, a few blocks over, and ended up at Conan High School and Harper Junior College. And, uh, you know, I just, I love living at Hoffman Estates, which was what drew me to well, work here for 28 years. I'm a retired police lieutenant here. I was in charge of all of our patrol. And uh, during my career there, I did a lot of things. I was in charge of our budget. I was our citizen police academy. I was our public information officer. A lot of different things. I've known these the trustees for years, have a lot of respect for them and for what they do for the village. Um, why am I running? Just a, a new, fresh perspective. Um, you know, have some ideas, of course, everyone has been saying, we should do this, we should do that. I just have some, some different ideas or some different things that I, I want to be involved. It's a great community and, and I look forward to trying to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we'll move on to the question part of the forum. Um, and Anna will be going first to answer the first, the first question. Um, the, the question is, what specific talents or experience do you have that make you a good choice to be a village trustee? And I realize you're already a village trustee, but what specific talents or experience do you bring that make you a good choice as a village trustee? Okay, first of all, experience. Another talent is, is I do have a gift of gab, so <laughs> no problem there. Um, I also have good listening qualities, so we're listening to our residents. What is going on? This is why we go to black parties. This is why we go to other events, because we want to know what is going on in your community. So having a good listening skill is very good. I've also worked for 21 years with seniors and disabled at the township. That is important because you get to know what their needs are. That's what the residents are to us. What is the need? So that's what I'm bringing to the table. Short and sweet before she gets me with the red stuff. Oh, yeah, you don't want the red stuff. No. Stop just short. Yeah, all right. Um, Gary P., what specific talents or experience do you uh, have that make you a good trustee? Yeah, thank you. Um, here we go. <laughs> Am I on? Try one more time. How's this? It's green. Uh, do you want that mic? It's not green. I think it's that. Um, so the talents I bring are, are really uh, leadership. I've been put in leadership positions all my life. And uh, I'm a helper. I love help and helping people and I have a helps gift. So uh, I'll show up to anything, you know, and just point me in a direction, uh, put me in. Uh, and, and anywhere I can help is really what I like to uh, do and get involved in. Uh, and much like Anna said, you know, we, we, one of the ways we help the community is by showing up, by serving. Uh, we're on uh, multiple volunteer commissions. I'm on the Veterans Commission, uh, which is the really warm jacket I'm wearing, and um, many others, Arts Commission, Plots Concert. And the volunteering uh, is really what I have a passion for in terms of our village and the volunteers, and just uh, what is really what makes our community what it is. So, uh, leadership. Really Great. Is. Thank you. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of like. Similar to what uh, Gary was saying, I have always been in positions of leadership my entire life, whether it was through sports or um, through work as I got promoted. And, uh, you know, I've been known as a fairly direct person. I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking and, uh, and listen to your ideas as well. And my biggest passion is the kids in our community. I've been running our youth football league for 34 years. I started a program through the police department called the Law Enforcement Athletics Program, which helps at risk kids. So, um, the kids in this community mean a ton to me, and I really just, you know, connected with so many families over the years. So um, I would say that would be my biggest strength is just my connection with uh, everyone in the community. Thank you. All right, and finishing up this question, Gary S. <laughs> this sounds very similar to everyone else, but experience is one of the reasons why I think I'm one of the best candidates. And. Uh, since 1985, I've been involved with the Village of Hoffman Estates. Uh, I became a member of the Environmental Commission at that time, and 
I was on that for three years, then became a member of the Youth Commission. From the Youth Commission, I went to the Planning Commission, and as I've already mentioned, I was on that for 22 years, and I last nine years, I believe, I was the chairman of the commission itself. And then I became uh, a trustee, and uh, with that, I uh, have been a, a good learner and good uh, listener, and between all of that, I believe that uh, that's what makes me a good candidate. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, we'll move on to our next question, and um, going first on this is going to be Gary P. The question is, what would you do to help Hoffman Estates enhance its own identity separate and apart from that of other area suburbs? Here it is again. What would you do to help Hoffman Estates enhance its own identity separate and apart from that of other suburbs, <coughs> other area suburbs? It's a great question. Glad I get to go first. Uh, so Hoffman Estates is really divided up in geography by really massive forest preserves. So to have one identity is almost a misnomer. We really have three identities. And you know, so you have a north side identity, a central side, and even a west side identity. Uh, but really, I think what brings us, uh, in terms of, I'm gonna steal something from Carol, what puts unity in the community is really uh, the commissions and you know, bringing those together for a common outcome of opportunities to serve and build that community. Uh, so we do a lot of events you know, and different festivals and whatnot. And I think that's really what gives us our identity is just kind of a neighborhood community, a hometown feeling, people love it here, they move in, they live here forever. And I think that's really um, the best part of our identity. Thank you. Um, next up is Mark. What, you know, that's a great question because a lot of people actually ask that, like, what is Hoffman Estates actually known for right now? I mean, what do you do? Shopper, do you got Woodfield, the other communities who have something? We really don't have a downtown area, and that's nothing of anyone's fault, just geography, we don't have a downtown area. We have an arena right now that has so much potential of doing other things. It's, yeah, we do have a parade once a year, 4th of July parade. You have other communities that are doing, I just walked in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in uh, Palatine. Communities, fest, um, that, if, we're, if, if we are kind of landlocked of other stuff we can do, let's do those hometown things. Let's use the arena and have a huge Pride Fest during uh, Pride Week. Let's do other things like that that nobody else is doing, and I think we have the ability to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Gary S. I don't know if I can improve upon the answer that Gary Bluff has actually gave. Uh, we have three different parts of town. We have a north, we have a south, and we have a west. And all three of those have their own distinct, I guess, divisions or some, something about them. Uh, we do have the Now Arena, as Mark said, and that does act as a center for all three. Uh, we have uh, the Plots con concert out there, we have the Fourth of July Fest out there, and uh, many other activities. Uh, we have the uh, tavern or bar or whatever, what do we call that? Uh, hideaway. Beer garden. Yeah, beer garden, beer garden. garden. <laughs> right, the hideaway. And uh, that also brings uh, out people to the, the village. And uh, now we have uh, the location that is uh, out uh, north of us uh, that took over the, uh, oops, I have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I got the bill. <laughs> All right, Anna, it's your turn to answer this one. All righty, not to be repetitive, and I'm gonna talk really quick. Um, so, how do we enhance it? We're having things like, okay, as they had mentioned, the beer garden. And I will bring this up only because people as far as Chicago are noticing it. And we're on the map for Hoffman Estates. Whether we're the north end or the south or the west end, each one of us. Now, if you want to talk about the north end, we got the great bakery out there. Yes. Popeyes will be coming. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, 30 seconds. Jeez, I can't get it all together in that. But anyway, so, and then the West End, yes, we have the Now Arena, but we do have the parades, okay, which brings people together. The Northwest Sports Fest, they're coming from everywhere, not just Hoffman Estates. So on top of all of that, we're making ourselves known one way or the other. I'm just gonna sit down before she waves the right <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. All right, that's, that's fine. 
All right, thank you so much for your answers there. Um, our next question is going to be started or answered first by Mark. So here is the question. Do you have ideas for increasing the productivity of the NOW arena? Please <laughs> and please share if you do. Uh, yes. I mean that's I, I have been a it's the now arena with me is is you know a big thing. First I live right by there, so um, you know the potential of just going to that. I think that arena can do so much and we talk about just a lot. Every weekend, as I have on my video that they put out, I think there should be some sort of a fest, there should be a fresh market. In the wintertime, we should have a Christmas, the Chris Crindle Mart out there with lights and people going there. This Naperville right now is having a outdoor beer fest in the wintertime. We have an open parking lot even that we can do something every single weekend. And that's thrown back on the general manager of them doing it. If they're not doing it, we need to get someone in there that's, that's going to do it. Thank you. Uh, uh, next on this one, Gary S. <clears throat> the word I was searching for before was Metro Burp. <laughs> anyway, uh, as far as the arena goes, I think Ben Gibbs does an excellent job. Uh, we had so many events last year. And uh, of course, you can always get more if you can get more. but. Uh, Ben goes out there and tries to get as many people as he can uh, to perform an act, and uh, he has done in the past, uh, in summertime, the last, uh, I think, two years, he brought out movies out there for at least one summer. Uh, he's also brought out uh, ice skating in the winter, because I remember skating there in the first couple of years. I think I was a trustee in 2011, 2012, and there was ice skating on the arena during Christmas time. Uh, so he does do different events out there, and I think uh, he's done an excellent job. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Anna, what ideas do you have to increase productivity of the NOW arena? Okay. Um, we can't have it, as far as I can tell, every single day. That's impossible. We have um, activities there right now. We have the Windy City Bulls. And yes, you have good ideas, okay? You know, maybe go outside, you know, do things like that. But you gotta have the people that want that. Uh, we did do a fresh market a few years ago, kind of like a flea market, and it didn't do that well. Um, it's maybe because of the times. COVID kind of kind of put a slow chop on a lot of things, okay? Um, I don't want to use that as an excuse, but. You know, we do have a good general manager, as it was mentioned. He does look for different things, but sometimes the venue, they're looking for more seating or they're looking for larger, larger venues to produce. So we can still, you know, hey, there's always a table and there's always times to sit down and say, hey, what can we do? That's all I have. All right, thank you. All right, next question. Um, Gary asks, we prepared, you're going first. Forgot, we forgot Gary. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> sorry. So catch <It's okay. laughs> what happens when you have two Garys. I know. <coughs> right. um, he's got the better hair, which I tell everybody. Anyway, um, so the arena's been under my leadership since 2010 because I chair finance. And that's when the developer who built it kind of dumped it on the village and left town. So I've had the pleasure of working with the general manager and they've tried everything. We've done flea markets, uh, we've done movies, we've done, so there's two ways to bring in events. You can either buy an event or you can get a promoter who, and, and either way, somebody's at risk. So do we risk the taxpayers' money by going out and getting a bunch of big concerts and maybe losing up to a million dollars or do we partner with promoters? So really, in the end game, it's a lot about finances. The arena last year had a record year uh, since it's been open for 16 years. And I think we're doing the right events. Is there always opportunity to do more or better? Heck yeah. Yeah, and we're, we're you know, uh, dedicated to doing that. But uh, so far, so good. And um, you know, we got a really good team running that place. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right, now Gary asks, we'll okay. go first on this question. What is your vision for the future of the former Sears property? How would you go about making this happen or how would you fund it? What is your vision for the future of the former Sears property? How would you go about making this happen or how would you fund this? You know, I don't have a vision for a Sears Center. Honestly, I don't know how you can. Uh, what you do want is uh, our economic development director to go out and uh, work with people who are actually developers who want to use that parcel of land for whatever purpose they have. 
and um, that is exactly what we are trying to do right now. Uh, we did have someone that was uh, thinking of buying that property. They were negotiating and um, they actually had a contract to purchase and uh, it fell through because they couldn't come up, come up with the financing. Uh, we believe that uh, in the near future, someone may also come back to, give, uh, to put a, a price on that uh, property and we expect that's gonna happen also uh, very soon. Uh, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anna, you're up next. Okay, as far as the Sears property goes, I really don't have a vision. I'm gonna be honest, okay? There's different things that keep coming up. If I had the crystal ball, I could tell you that. Uh, whatever is decided or brought forth and we're going to look at, we have to see that it's going to help our residents and our community so that it's not something that's going to be a dinosaur that's gonna sit out there and look nice. Um, so that's all I can say for that. Um, that like Gary had mentioned, there were people that had come forth, but <laughs> things didn't pan out. And as the ever changing economy, as we've heard about Silicon Valley and these other places, whatever comes up, we have to make sure that this is going to go forward and be a good fit for Hoffman. That's all I can. Thank you. Um, Gary P, I'm including you in this round. <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> so uh, in a leadership role, I chair the Economic Development Commission. So I have a vision for everything in Hoffman Estates. My vision for Sears is retail's dying, offices dead, COVID changed the game, and really what's being looked at in terms of that property is spec industrial, data center space, which would bring tens of millions of tax dollars from the utility taxes, and good use. Uh, we just toured Microsoft yesterday. That place is a boom, and uh, they just bought another 30 acres, so that is hot. Everybody has things in the cloud, all your pictures, your videos. This will be in somebody's cloud, hopefully Microsoft. Uh, so that's really what I see for Sears. I also see multifamily. I also see gravity of place, you know, uh, work, live, play. That's a big uh, tagline of ours. So we, we need to have some kind of gravity out there. And I think, you know, a combination of that work, live, play is really what we're after. Thank you. Um, Mark, it's your turn. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize how big that Sears uh, corporate is. I mean, it's 2.1 million square feet. It's, it's so big they have a... A vault in the basement there it's a huge huge complex so yeah you can't just all of a sudden turn it into a target or turn something like that my vision of that and I've said before can being people who do that for a living even outside of our village and say what do you think of it and I did such a thing my friend is one of the number one developers in the state and he threw out there saying hey how about looking to turn it into a d3 college right now you could call up Johnson or something plug and play take your entire thing put it right into that. Is that the right answer for that? Who knows? But thinking of the what ifs and why nots, it's a massive complex. Do I agree with data centers and all that stuff? I, I'm, I'm not totally sold on that yet. You know, with the Microsoft property you said, there's not a lot of employees there, it doesn't bring in some taxes. I'd rather see something that's gonna bring in more residents, uh, more jobs. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, uh, the next question Anna will be answering first. Uh, the question is, what is the top infrastructure project on your list? Why and how would you pay for it? What is the top infrastructure project on your list and why and how would you pay for it? Okay, top infrastructure. Our favorite, sewers and water. Okay, a lot of our communities are really aging. We're all celebrating the 50, 60 year mark. A lot of our sewers, water, um, that is, I think, the most important. We get funding from different places, whether it's from the state or there's grants that we look for. Uh, we do smoke testing to make sure that all of our infrastructure is working. Uh, we don't want to find out that all of a sudden we have leaks in certain places and there's water testing constantly going on. So that. Uh, I think it's really, really important is because as our community ages and we are building out, we need to have that taken care of. So that's it. Thank you. Um, Gary P. 
Thanks, Kim. I'm going to start with your second question first. So I chair finance and I chair capital improvements. And uh, if the money's not there, we're just talking, right? You got to have the money. So we have 7.5 million in uh, the capital improvement budget. We have roads that need to be done. We're putting 6.2 million there. We have bridges. We have sewer and water, like Anna said. Uh, we also have old fire stations. Two of them are older than most of us up here, maybe combined. So <laughs> those need to be addressed, 21, 22 or old. Uh, and, you know, really, uh, having a strong financial position gives us a ton of options. Uh, we also have, you know, infrastructure needs that are technology, right? Everything is now fiber and uh, all kinds of really fast compute and storage uh, in, in real time video. We have officers now that have body cams. Those things upload real time. So a lot of infrastructure things, but the money's there. So we have a ton of options. Thank you. Um, Mark, it's your turn. It's great to hear that the money's there, like Gary said, because you know what, we gotta start spending it then. Let's bury these lines so people can stop losing their power all the time. I mean, we've, I, where I grew up, every time the rain went out, the power went out. That's the same overhead lines that they still have right now. And it's nice that finally this was brought up and brought to the village board of like holding Cobhead accountable for what they're doing. Um, but that has to be a number one thing being addressed. I mean, some of the residents were staying there. They say, we trim the trees every three or four years. They have people saying, we haven't trimmed our trees over here for 15 years. So that has to be number one. Number one right over there, take care of that issue. And then some street lighting. I think when we do this, there are certain areas of town between solar and upgraded things like that. We could throw in some uh, streets or street lighting. Some of the areas over here in parcel um, A and B, though, talking to some people, they like that quiet, dark feel. Uh, they don't want it totally lit. But some intersections, yes, I think we need some more lighting. Thank you. And um, last on this question is Gary S. Okay, the top um, one for me is streets and roads. Uh, and they are getting done as they are every uh, year. Different roads are getting done, rehabbed, uh, and reconstructed each year. Second on the list for me would be what Anna mentioned, uh, the infrastructure regarding uh, plumbing and works like that. Uh, as far as streetlights that Mark has mentioned, uh, that is on our list. We have uh, a consultant now working on that as far as where we might put in uh, streetlights. Uh, they would be on the corners usually, not during the, on the roads that they actually exist at this point. So that is where we are at this point for me. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next question, uh, Gary P. will be answering first. And the question is, residents of all our suburbs have a heightened awareness of crime. Can you please describe the approach Hoffman Estates is taking on crime and public safety? And what, if anything, would you change? I'll read it again. Residents of all our suburbs have a heightened awareness of crime. Can you please describe the approach Hoffman Estates is taking on crime and public safety? And what, if anything, would you change? Yeah, great question. So uh, the number one crime statistic that's going up in our town is uh, vehicles being stolen. People leave their keys in their car. They leave their purses, their computers. We have smash and grabs. Uh, we also have you know access that's fast and close to the interstate. Uh, we have a lot of cells of bad guys. Uh, and we're actually working with all forms of law enforcement at the federal level, the state level, and even the local municipalities. Uh, our chiefs are part of a consortium. Uh, we are you know, identifying and investigating the rings of bad guys and bringing them to justice as well as planning uh, ways to you know, continue to monitor uh, you know, through video surveillance uh, as well as some proactive ways of having more officers in the field uh, so our uh, traffic control division is augmented uh, by investigations and other divisions uh, when we have a heightened times of when there are burglaries and incidents that happen in town. Thank you. Mark? I finally got one that I could say I was a part of uh, with yeah. everything else on the other commission. So obviously I was in charge of, of our patrol division for years. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is our, our minimum manpower on the street every day in Hoffman Estates is only eight officers. Eight. And many of the days they're at minimums or below minimums because they work 12 hour shifts, guys call in sick. The staffing is terrible. And it's not, it's not even like a, a village issue, like it's some, the board's doing something wrong, the staffing's bad. 
It has to do with money. It has to do with guys like me that retired. It's it's, it's the staffing's bad. So we got to we got to help with the staffing and other stuff they're starting to do with the community service officers, and uh, and that helps out a little bit. But we don't realize too is what Gary talked about. Our traffic units and like our gang units, there's only like one or two guys in those anymore. Those units had to be disbanded just the, the field control. So we need more guys. Thank you, um, Gary S. You know, I really can't improve upon the answer that Gary Palapas gave, or Mark for that matter. They know more about this than I do. And uh, that, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your brevity. Uh, Anna. Okay, you're going to get my two cents on this one. Hawkmas, I think, is very, very safe. Okay, we do have crime. Okay, I will give you that. But it's like everywhere else. People are coming from other places. They're, they're coming and doing things here. Um, some of the things I think we need to do um, to help the police is, as the, uh, Gary had mentioned, you're leaving your purse out in the car. And the door is open. You're inviting crime. Same goes for your homes. You should check your windows. I had a perfect example, neighbor, Somebody came up, opened her back window. You should check your windows. So let's help them. We're getting the office, the cams, which is going to be a big help. We also have neighborhood watch programs that we all, a lot of our neighborhoods sit down and we talk. The officers come out and tell us, hey, what's the crime in your area? What do we need to do to help them? Because he said, yes, there's only eight. Oops, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> You might get more time on that thought in the next question. Yeah. Um, and it's going to Mark first. The next question is, what, if anything, should Hoffman Estates be doing to strengthen the relationship between the police department and the residents? What, if anything, should Hoffman Estates be doing to strengthen the relationship between the police department and village residents? Two Mark. for two of questions. I'm on, I'm on, a, I'm on a roll now. Um, the neighborhood watches are good. I mean, I was in charge of those. So neighborhood watches are good. Have the, the strengthen. The, with the residents, it's literally communication and trust. We have a great police department. We have good supervisors. We have young officers who want to do a good job. Body cameras are great. That's just about accountability. Okay, having body cameras, accountability, that's fantastic. It really just gets back to the community trusting the officers that are here, seeing them out in public, um, the old way when you see them, and. Uh, and those kind of relationships. Also, these officers getting involved in the community. Like I said, I started that law enforcement athletics program. You know, go to calls and officers or know the families because they're interacting with that. So it's it's that old school family relationship that uh, that's how you strengthen any um, relationship with the police. Thank you. Gary S. Well, Mark gave an excellent answer again. Uh, we have a national night out and that is one of the reasons uh, the police meet with our community. And uh, there are it's usually, I think, more than one national ice out in our community uh, where the population gets a chance to meet with our police. And uh, there's always other chances that they have uh, if they want to go to the police department themselves and uh, meet with the police officers. But uh, I think the national ice out is the, the number one thing that we do. Thanks. Thank you. Anna? Well, in a lot of our, as we do in the summertime block parties, you have the police come out, the fire come out, they all introduce themselves, they all talk, they all ask if there's anything going on, and this is the reason we go to these things. Um, the police also, in our neighborhoods, we see their squad cars, and if you're going on vacation, you call them and they will be checking your homes. Um, there's no reason to be afraid of them. They're very outgoing, and we have a lot of, as he said, you know, we have National Night Out. There's other events. They had tours of the building. There was things that they promote in the citizen. So the, I think the police have been very forward and very engaging in our communities, even though you're retired. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gary P. I'm going to try to use some of the words so correct. Um, we've been doing what's called beat meetings. And uh, a beat is like a geography, right? So 
uh, our police shows up, our chief with a bunch of police officers, and we met at a school, one out north, one out west, and one central, and the place was packed, standing room only. So there's two things I think people want, transparency and communication. And we have a Citizens Police Academy, we have a fire academy, uh, we do the beat meetings now. Uh, you know, we're creating a commission for people that hate the police and want to defund the police, and all the good things that, you know, Blue Line is doing. Uh, so I think there's a lot of goodness. I can't get it all in a minute, but uh, you know we have a lot of great ideas, and I think you know those transparency and community meetings are really what's uh, galvanizing us with the community and our police. Thank you. Okay, next question, and Gary S will be starting this one. Um, what do you think Hoffman Estates should do, if anything, to make more affordable housing and/or senior housing? available within its borders. What do you think Hoffman Estates should do, if anything, to make more affordable housing and or senior housing available within its borders? We have a lot of senior housing right now in Hoffman Estates. And uh, as far as affordable housing, I'm not sure that we have a need in our village for that. Uh, currently, the people that are coming in front of us are not affordable housing people. Uh, they want to charge prices uh, anywhere from $1,700 for a, a one bedroom or, and above uh, for their housing. Uh, the current housing that we have is older stock. And that stock, I guess, is what we would consider now affordable housing because they are of a lower rent uh, nature. So I would assume, and I, I would say at this point, uh, we have no need. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Anna, you're next. Okay. <clears throat> affordable housing. When you say affordable housing and you're looking at somebody who gets, say, $1,700 a month and the rent is $1,100, where do you go from there? What are you actually living at? So when they say affordable housing, I think some of the things and I don't know if this would happen, there would have to be some investigating and checking at a lot of pages. And the thing being is that maybe some of these buildings that are getting empty, is there any way to turn them into shelters for those that are homeless or to turn them into housing where somebody can <coughs> afford and not be living at just $600 and then having to go to the food pantry because after they pay all their utilities and everything else, they can't make it. And she's gonna hit me with the stop sign, so there you go, and it's a long conversation. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Gary P. So I'm gonna continue off of what Anna said, and I'm gonna hit the uh, special needs area. So we have great high schools and elementary schools that do a lot with education and integration, and we don't have anywhere for those young adults to live when they turn 22. They stay at home with their aging parents until they die, and then it's an emergency, and the state has to place them. And maybe they're in Carbondale and not Hoffman Estates where the rest of their family is. That's an atrocity. And by the way, when it comes to non-disabled housing, we have more affordable housing than any 10 neighborhoods and suburbs around here combined, right? So I think really what our focus needs to be is to look at special needs housing. You know, we have GGs, uh, we have a great uh, community of special needs people. I think the opportunities out there and we can do some private-public partnerships financially to really bring those two ideas together and uh, codify a, kind of a whole new generation of the work, play, live. Thank you. Uh, Mark. The village is halfway landlocked of what's actually available to build uh, new housing. And then you get certain areas like I live out west. We're paying over $13,000 a year to send kids to Elgin schools. You got people out there that are saying, well, you know, wow, so you're talking about taxes and stuff like that. I would rather reinvest our efforts into our, our um, condo complexes and stuff that we have here, we'll work with them, make them look better. Those are affordable housing right now. People live there, and we have that exactly like what Gary said, the, the new um, high-end rentals. Um, that's not going to go away, but that's not the answer either. So I would rather work with what we have right now, reinvest, help these either landlords or private um, owners 
and even our regular residents. We have a lot of houses in this town that need to be updated. We need to help those people that are falling on hard times and, and give them the help they need. Thank you. All right, and now we're moving on to our final question of the morning. Thought this would never come, right? Um, Anna will be starting this one, um, and maybe it's a shorter answer. Are you accepting any campaign funding from PACs, special interest groups, or political parties? And if so, which ones and why? Are you accepting any campaign funds from PACs, interest groups, or political parties? And if so, which ones and why? This is going to be the quickest answer there was, and she won't even flag me. No, no. Okay. So it might be free. Uh, Gary P. Yeah, you know, I have a brother from another mother. His name's Paul, and he almost finances my campaign single-handedly. I love him dearly. He doesn't even live in the state. He lives up in Wisconsin. But uh, other than that, packs, nothing. Um, just family and friends. Yeah, the people that want me to keep doing this. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I think with everyone for for this campaign, this hasn't been a very high spending um, outlook. You know, some, some mailers, you know, me and Gary are out doing videos all over the town, stuff like that, that's cheap. But it's, um, yeah, for me, no, same thing, friends and family, and, and honestly, people are fairly stingy with wanting to give money. Look at your voter turnout. City of Chicago said 32% of people went and voted for that first mayoral one. You know, hopefully that's the whole thing now, is just telling people to get out and vote, especially our younger community. The young people, they don't vote. They're not that they don't care, they just, they don't vote. So um, the answer is, yeah, pretty much is begging friends for some money to send out a mailer. Right. Thank you. Uh, Gary, yes. Uh, the answer is no, we don't have any packs or any other. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right. All right, thank you. All right, and now we move on to our closing statements. Each candidate will have one minute to answer, and it is uh, Gary P's turn to go first. And on the last one, first on the last. Yeah, thank you so much. I just want to thank you all for coming today. I want to thank you for the investment that you make in our community just by showing up. I want to thank the Women League of Voters for hosting Chamber Library and all your staff for giving us this space. Uh, I love this community. I'm passionate about it. I'm not going anywhere, win or lose. Uh, this is somewhere that I call home, and it is going to be that way, and I'm going to do anything I can to make it better, no matter where I serve and what I do. Thank you. Mark? Uh, thank you guys for coming out and watching this, and everyone who's going to be watching at home. Um, I agree with what Gary says. I, you know, I love this community. That's why I still live in town where other people are moving out of state. And there, I, I'm really I'm looking just to give back now that I'm outside of Police work, but still give back to this community. I'm a big guy of what ifs and why nots. And that's what I plan on giving. I can guarantee you one thing. I will not agree with everything that the board does, but I'm also going to listen to them. I've known them for years, respect the work that they've done. But I have not had a chance to be in any of these positions, to be on a commission, or to give these ideas. So that's um, what I want to do. And I can, I can promise you that I will work hard at it. Thank you. Thank you. Gary S. Uh, thank you for coming out. And as Gary said, thank you to the League of Women Voters. Thank you to Schomburg Township and the library for having us here. And uh, as Gary said, he's not going anywhere, neither am I. I've been here for 44 years now, and uh, I plan on staying here for the rest of my life. Thank you. Thank you. Anna. All right, I get to bring up the end here. Okay. Thank you to the League of Voters. Uh, women voters, appreciate that. Thank you for Schomburg Library having us in a nice warm place. Um, like anything else, whether it's raining, snowing, we're like the male people out there, and that's kind of me, customer service. It doesn't matter the weather, the people are what makes all this, and we're here to hear you. And customer service is the biggest thing. It's been my home. I'm not gonna choke up on this one and she's gonna play me with that doggone thing again. So anyway, I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Uh, whatever you're celebrating, whether you're continuing the St. Paddy's or St. Joseph's or whatever, March Madness. But you know what? This is what it's all about, being with people and trying to help them. And when you know you've helped them when they walk out and they got a smile on their face and you answer that question of what should I do? Not that we'll always have the answers, but you know what, that's why we're always a team.
Oops, she's not me anyway. Okay. <laughs> thank you. All right. I want to thank all the candidates for your participation. This one has been a pleasure. Um, we'd like to encourage all you candidates and residents to recycle your campaign signs after April 4th. Um, please visit the, our website at lwbpalatineareaorg for details about voting and recycling your signs. If you're not a registered voter or if you have questions about the voting process, we have a table outside the door where you can um, get your questions answered. Uh, on behalf of the Palatine League of Women Voters and the library, thank you all for coming. And don't forget, early voting begins Monday, March 20th, um, and uh, the real election day is April 4th, whichever way you choose to vote. Um, please participate in democracy by casting your ballot. Remember, your vote is your voice. Thank you so much, and that's important for today.